Hi, everyone. Welcome back for this uh, new episode of uh, Remote Job Fest uh, webinar. Today, we are talking about innovation and more specifically, innovation that happened during the COVID time. Uh, we have today amazing uh, speakers that are going to share what they have seen in the market. Uh, we have uh, Kun Ansiri here. Hey, Ans. Um, she's the Deputy Director of Trula UTC and the Research Center. Uh, she's going to talk about the amazing things that Shula University, alongside with the startup ecosystem, have been building together uh, to, um, to face this COVID situation. We have also Cohen here. Hi, Cohen. Hi, guys. Cohen is a partner of uh, Push Nation, uh, one of the greatest uh, event ticketing uh, and IoT uh, company uh, we know in, in South Asia. And he's going to talk about some really interesting pivots that you guys have done to adapt to the market uh, while continuing your core business. Uh, and also we have uh, Kuntoy here, which is the SVP data analytics of Fraser, one of the largest property real estate group that we have uh, in Thailand and South Asia, but also a worldwide uh, company. So maybe we start with Hans. Maybe Hans, you know, introduce yourself and tell us what you've been uh, doing. Uh, and um, and yeah, let's go. Let's go with this flow. I want to keep this as a discussion to make it, you know, quite chill and uh, and and insightful. So so yeah, let's let's go with with that way. Thank you, John. Sawadika uh, on uh, Naka. Um, so I'm the deputy director for uh, UTC, uh, the Chulai Longkorn University. Technology Center. Uh, so we're a platform that helps our researchers commercialize their research and we are focused on two verticals and that's medtech and AI data science and robotics. And what we do is we uh, scout for technologies within our university and help them bridge uh, the valley of death. So that's often the times when research uh, gets published but oftentimes it doesn't get make its way to the marketplace. Um, so we go in and help our startups, our professors uh, with looking at anything from IP, if there's any IP to protect their deep tech research, all the way to connecting them with industry partners, helping make sure that they understand the rules and regulations that govern, govern their research and help them form strategies. And then in the end, we want their research to benefit society and get you know returned back um, to the community. Uh, so we help them explore vehicles in which they can do that whether that's licensing to industry partners or they can spin off into their own startups. Awesome. So it's really integrated with the startup ecosystem. And I think that's what is really great. Um, I've seen you guys have been publishing a, a tech COVID startup website, something. Uh, you will talk about this very soon because uh, when I went to the hospital, actually the doctor told me about this. Uh, that was very interesting. So, so yeah, uh, awesome aunts and looking forward to hear in details what you got in the pipeline. Uh, maybe we can go with uh, Kuntai. Yeah, sure. Thanks for uh, having me join. Uh, my name is Delikap Sodikap. I'm SVP of Data Science and Analytics, part of Innovation and Technology Group in Fraser Property. Uh, I have a academic background in innovation and technology for over 10 years, and this is what I'm passionate about. So my role, I'm responsible for all data-related innovation in Fraser, ranging from setting a data strategy, conducting due diligence, and developing new innovation derived from insight and AI. So just a little bit about Fraser property, right? So Fraser is a multinational real estate company, right? We are a leader in integrated real estate platform, right? With multi-asset class experience. We have offices around the world whether in the UK, Australia, China, and our head office is located in Singapore. So our market cap in 2019 was around 3.4 billion Singapore dollars, roughly around 80 billion Thai baht. So in Thailand, we also have the same expertise. We have multi assets class, uh, ranging from retail, industrial park, and residential properties. We are also one of the largest uh, uh, industrial REIT or the trust in Thailand. So regarding the roles of innovation at Fraser, if you may, innovation is one of the core strategies uh, in Fraser, Thailand. So we aim to capitalize on technologies and digital revolution for resilient tomorrows. So our innovation derives from design thinking concept, right? 
ideation basically is the first step of our innovation process where all the project must pass three criteria, namely whether the project is feasible, viable, or desirable. So everyone must agree upon these three criteria. So we always start with the questions, what, uh, how might we, sorry, how might we leverage what we have? How might we resolve the situations? How might we introduce new innovation to cope with the current pandemic, so on and so forth. And then once we come up with um, the solid idea, we proceed to investment base. Usually we use IRR as the main criteria to select our innovation. So, and then we think about adoption, acceleration, and growth. So these are the role of innovation in Fraser. Thank you, John. Great. So we really have here one really active corporate company that is also investing and doing R&D, right? So that's pretty rare. And that's why I really wanted to have you guys on the panel. Uh, I think it's gonna be really exciting to hear what, what you guys have developed uh, because around IoT and robotics and AI, there's not that many companies in Thailand that are that active, uh, I think. Great. Um, okay, Quen, this, uh, this is your turn. And uh, please, you know, impress us because I've been really impressed, honestly, by hearing what you guys have done with this healthcare situation, so. Thank you, uh, John. Swati Cup, everybody. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Kun. I am a uh, regional director and partner um, for Pouch Nation. Pouch Nation is a startup started five years ago in uh, Singapore uh, with, a, with an, an RFID event product um, based around ticketing, cashless payments, access control. Uh, and that, 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 that business did very well. Uh, we became the market leader in Southeast Asia for event technologies quite, quite rapidly, uh, opening offices uh, across all of Southeast Asia. We now operate eight offices across uh, seven countries. Uh, and we, uh, we closed our round B last year, um, uh, around this time last year, um, which, which was, which was a, a great success and a great reward for all the work that gone into the company until that date. Um, we... Uh, some, Six months ago, we had two main um, verticals. Uh, we worked in the events industry, uh, mobile solutions, uh, POS systems, uh, ticket scanning, uh, all RFID based. And we, had a, we launched a second product, which was a, a venue POS system, um, a cashless POS system. That got very uh, pop popular uh, rapidly as well. So we see uh, big chain uh, hostels uh, signing onto that. Uh, over the last year uh, 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 across Southeast Asia, but also beyond. Um, so the two main um, revenue streams for us was, was, was venues and events. And then we faced the biggest event of a lifetime, which was COVID. And obviously uh, our business got really affected because there have been no events and there will be no events for a while. Um, venues are empty, hostels are closing the doors, hotels are closing the doors, staff are being laid off. So we, um, we, we had to make some decisions to, to go forward. And um, I think these, these kind of situations bring, bring the best and the worst out of people. And, and uh, for us, it's kind of brought the best out of a lot of people do who really uh, sort of stood up to the challenge. We started thinking, uh, live streaming, uh, you know, we, we, we have the, the entertainment background, we have the connections with events organizers, with technical suppliers. So, so one branch of our company uh, went into streaming and online uh, content uh, with social media integrations, and etc. It's, it's something called Click. Uh, it's an app and it's, uh, it was launched actually last week. We did our first online stream, which received like 100,000 viewers. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, streaming a band called Razor back from the Philippines. That that that's on its way. That's an operational. The app the, is available online. Uh, personally, I've been leading a task force to develop our um, our medical uh, our medical tools, our health monitoring tools, uh, the wristbands that we traditionally use for the events. Um, we had so much experience in that field about patron technologies, monitoring behaviors. Uh, people, movement, geolocation, all that. That's what we did for five years in the world of events. And I thought, you know, well, not just me, but we thought, uh, you know, we need to port that, that knowledge and that, that trust that we have from the industry 
to 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 the current situation. So we we ended up adding a temperature monitor to the wristbands. So we 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 got the components, we got the supply chain all in place. Um, it's it's been through our R and D, and we now actually operating these wristbands that uh, not only uh, monitor your temperature uh, continuously. They also uh, can link to, to with Bluetooth to either a mobile phone or a local, local network, which allows for, for geolocation, contact tracing, uh, uh, even um, isolation, quarantine, you can set the location. Uh, and and the, the uptake has been fantastic. We really uh, seen, seen such a fantastic response. Uh, we're talking to governments like all over the world, literally from South Africa, uh, our, our traditional region, uh, Philippines, the ambulance services are now uh, looking to put this on all their, uh, all their ambulance staff who are at the front line and are at high risk. Uh, we're talking to taxi companies, uh, we're talking to uh, transport uh, systems in the region where they want to make sure um, that the, the old guns that people put to your head at the moment, you, you've been seeing that a lot in recent months. Um, they're not necessarily safe, they're not necessarily clean, they're not that accurate, the results don't really go anywhere. So this answers a lot of those questions and concerns. Uh, so yeah, we are very uh, excited. Personally, I'm very excited to, to really have something we, where, where the business collapsed from, from you know, being very successful to, to having zero revenues. Um, Songkran in Thailand, it all happened just before Songkran, which is traditionally our biggest month in Thailand. We had 14 events in the books. Uh, Lots of events in Bangkok, in Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Hua in Pattaya. And all of that overnight, we wiped like a serious amount of money over the books, off the books, and was like, oh God, you know, and, and you know, there was no one to blame. You couldn't, we couldn't even go after the clients and say, there's a contract. It just, you know, we couldn't do that. So we, we, we pivoted quite quickly, and the, 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 the sales teams, the, the development teams, the, it all got, sort of put our heads together and came up with this new product. And that's now, um, that, that's now in, in being launched. Um, we're taking orders, we've signed contracts. It's, uh, it's, it's very exciting how, how uh, a team can, can get together, come together and, and totally uh, pivot and come up with something totally new and, and unique. There's no one else at the moment who has a product like this. It'll only be a matter of time, obviously, because I'm just telling everybody the whole world what we're doing. So there'll be people copying this as we speak, but um, I believe we're gonna, we're gonna win that uh, potential competition fight because we are so established. We've been around for five years. We have all these re regional offices. We have a sales network. We have a fantastic track record. We have backing, we have supply chain. So uh, yeah, exciting times of progenation for sure. Thank you. Yeah, amongst the fact that I'm actually one of you, the user of Pot Nation, I've been, uh, I've been, I've been using that in many events, uh, not to mention their names, but um, yeah, I've been using you guys. I've been incredibly surprised and admirative, honestly, of how fast you guys have been pivoting towards this new amazing uh, product, which uh, I guess will have a lot of uh, G2G clients, right? Governments and, and uh, global institutions will definitely be interested to that. Um, to the fact that maybe that's actually a lucky business uh, turnover for you guys, right? Um, you may have become a global company overnight um, yeah, based on uh, from this situation. And I think it's, uh, it's an incredible case. Uh, and this is why I wanted to elevate you uh, and First Nation uh, alongside with uh, Fraser, which is a global company, and Shula, who is doing global research. Um, because, yeah, I really think you guys deserve it. Um, and, um, and, and so from my side, I'm, I'm partially interested uh, about, about those cases of adaptivity, right? Companies that are somehow adapting uh, really quickly because to me, and, and I think this is what Getlinks believes, um, it's all about every 10, 20 years, the rules of the business game are being reshuffled, right? There is a major event that happened. Um, maybe this is the biggest event since the World War II. We will see the consequences in terms of uh, of the, this pandemic, but I think the biggest consequence is really how the new normal uh, gonna be evolving, right? Uh, how much events will we have in the future? How much wedding will we be to attend? And how will be the configuration of this wedding? Will we have to actually have face mask uh, in wedding uh, of more than 100 people? Will we have to 
have temperature check or maybe the post nation we spend uh, if we if we can enter the wedding, right? So all the mass uh, and celebration events that we have known and that we're defining our culture and who we are really socially um, today going to be redefined. Partially, if next year we see another wave of COVID, right? If we see that it's become a regular thing, we we can really see how the privacy uh, and uh, the connection between our data uh, and our freedom gonna be changed and redefined, right? You can see how in China, WeChat is deeply integrated uh, where what you can do, where you can go uh, and this scoring algorithm, right? So I'm really interested into that. I think this is part of what GetLinks is all about, uh, the digital transformation and see the good side of it and also telling the people before it happened, the bad side of it, right? Uh, and that's also where I've been writing this book called The Adaptive Economy, uh, which I didn't, I didn't plan for the COVID situation to happen. I'm not a, a witcher, uh, but somehow I was talking uh, uh, on two chapters about the possibility of having a global pandemic that will accelerate the digital transformation. Um, and that just happened. Um, so, so my book is really... Uh, about this, right? How can people adapt to the environmental changes that will happen during the next decade? Um, and environment change can be climate change, pandemics, but also digital transformation and digital disruption uh, are a major factor of how our world is changing and how we as human will interact very differently, right? So I think this topic really is exciting and uh, I really want to get you guys to showcase that. Right, to showcase how institutions, uh, academic institutions like Chulalong Khan University, which is you know, the biggest, best university in Thailand, have been able to adapt um, to cope with the situation. How companies, startups like yours, uh, could have, been, have been coping with the situation to actually make maybe profit from this. And how um, Fraser, uh, a corporate company that is so big, right? $3 billion market cap, it's huge, right? Have been able to identify and accelerate some parts of the digital transformation process to adapt as a company. Because the individuals and the companies who will be able to adapt the fastest next two, three, six months will be the winner of the business game for the next decade, right? The businesses and individuals who will be able to adapt to this new normal will be the new leader for the next decade. So please, leader, share us um, what you've been seeing as great innovation uh, during the past couple of weeks uh, and make us excited and positive about what is here to come as well in the next couple of months. Maybe we can start with um, Kun Tai, with Fraser, because I heard you guys have got some, some really cool robots on there. Yeah, okay. Thanks, uh, John. So be before going to the robot, I would like to uh, take my view on COVID-19, right, and innovation in Fraser, right? So in, in my view, COVID-19 is like a innovation accelerator. It has changed the way we live. It changed the way we interact with others. It changed the way we order food, right? Now, most people would get used to ordering foods via grabs or via get, right? And e-meetings is everywhere. So the perception towards hygienics totally changed. Now we think about um, watching hand every time we uh, have physical contact with anything, right? And now we encounter different stages of the pandemics. And I believe we have uh, entered the spread this relation phase in Thailand because the number of new cases reaches the peaks, I think previous three weeks. And now the infection rates start declining. So if I'm not wrong, the new cases rate a couple less than five or six um, in the last three, four days. So during the crisis, the first thing that comes to my mind is how to maintain and manage ongoing businesses in Fraser. Right. So everyone is yeah, aware and believe in the you know new era of e e-learning adoption, e-meeting adoption. So this kind of thing is playing very important roles in business operations. So maybe previously we have to interact face-to-face, -face. we have to commute white car or BTS to the work, 
but now it's no longer like that. So it's actually accelerated the way we uh, adopt new technology in, in, in Fraser. So as a data side team, right, we, we know that COVID-19 information is all over the place. We actually develop a web app, so called Thailand COVID-19 Insight Platform to keep every right. staff informed yeah, about the latest situation uh, of the COVID-19. We acquire data locally and internationally and make everyone informed about relevant information. The web app keep uh, updating the information on a real-time basis and everyone can simply check uh, on the one source of information. So the second thing that comes into my mind regarding the COVID and business impact is about how can we leverage innovation to help uh, maintaining FPT business in terms of cost and process optimization. Basically COVID-19, right, in my view, it helps speeding up digital platform development for Fraser. Currently, we're developing the so-called uh, the digital platform for industry park management. Where now Fraser own and manage over 100 industry parks nationwide. So we basically use AI and machine learning uh, to manage uh, the activities on site, and we, we call this project as Dashway, which currently the operation requires a lot of staff, task force to go on site to operate and manage. Uh, the operation. So we believe this innovation would help operate and manage industry park in a more proactive way and of course remotely. It would require lesser staff. So the main goals of the innovation uh, that we have created including traffic monitoring and forecasting right on site. We can also track business performance um, divided by zone in the industrial park, which currently it would require a lot of task force to drive and check on site physically. So it's no, long, no longer require that. And we can also uh, detect intruder on site using AI and machine learning. And we're using uh, geofencing to manage parking activities on site. So all of this is actually the result from COVID-19 help us to accelerate the way we innovate in Fraser. And right. lastly, right, the robot that you just mentioned, with the impact from COVID-19, uh, it has changed the way people think about the hygienic process. So here in Fraser, we just launched the so-called autonomous UV robot. It's known as Sunburst UV bots. Actually, the name speaks for itself, right? Uh, because the robots move around. Let me talking about the robot, right? The robot is filled with a lamp module emitting power, UV light, right? The robot move around autonomously and guided by light detection, also called LiDAR technologies, and also rain and using sensor to uh, control the robot. The UVC basically emitted by the lamp module helps decontaminate the environment by tearing apart strains of viruses DNA. So no need for uh, human staff to go cleaning or uh, spraying alcohol on the objects. We just use this robot. So That's amazing. You will see basically would kill around 99% of bacteria. And it has been clinically proven to eliminate all the viruses, but not all the viruses, I would say 99%, right? The, the robot will disinfect surfaces, um, I believe more effectively than manual cleaning. And it reduces the needs for cleaners and also help protect the health of frontline cleaning staff. So this is what we have done so far in terms of uh, digital transformation. So let me recap again, right? First is help um, optimize cost and process using AI and machine learning. Second is help accelerate the way we adopt new technologies all the e-platform, whether e-learning, e-meetings, or e-ordering. And lastly, it helped me think about new innovation like UV robot to help our society and, and help uh, the cleaning staff not to risk their life to do the cleaning on site. We can just rely on the robot itself. Right. Thank you, John. Yeah, when I think about this, I, I'm learning so much from, from this, right? Because it just totally makes sense, right? If I use someone to manually clean surfaces, 
they cannot do so much and they need to manually do so much, right? So a limited time is not really scalable, right? But UV, if it's really cleaning 99% of the, of the bacteria or viruses in a surface, it's just, it's just much more efficient. So, yeah, exactly. so this is, this is, uh, this, this just makes sense. Right. And, and for you guys, uh, as a real estate and assets management property company, you have so many surfaces, right? So that, that makes sense for, for you as a high priority. Um, uh, because today, as you mentioned in the new remote economy, yeah. um, contactless, everything will be the new normal, right? People won't touch cash because they will be scared that the virus is on cash, right? So we will see the increase of uh, remote contactless payment methods uh, that are very, very spritely uh, used in China already, right? With which side you can just pay with a phone like this. Uh, even in, in Africa, right? In Nigeria and other countries, mobile payment is already very common. But in traditional economies like here, and even in Europe, right? I'm French. In France, we never use on phone to pay and we'll be like, why not to mm -hmm. cash, right? But yeah. today the new remote economy will actually oblige us to do that, right? So I think having a robot that can do contactless screening is a real new category uh, that we will never have believed uh, maybe a few months ago. So I think it's pretty amazing. And on the other side, uh, on the digital transformation, yeah, this this been this been on the agenda of every company for the last five years or ten years, right? Um, back to when I was a student, uh, I, I worked uh, as an intern for Google back in Paris, and we were already helping BNP Paribas on the digital transformation, right? And that was like ten years ago, <laughs> right? But as you mentioned, no, this new reorganization on the workplace have cons considerably pushed this new digital transformation on not a cool innovator leadership angle because it's not just cool it's it's a need now right companies need to learn how to digitalize their team and processes because during the social distancing time you cannot have anyone at the office for a few weeks right so you have to work on google spreadsheet and zoom Right, uh, I've read this article about how the boomers were really having difficulty to adapt to Zoom and to the new work from home situation, and uh, and it's been pretty funny because for us millennials, uh, you know, we've been we've been completely used to that, right? Um, but I think I think again, it's not about the age; it's really about the mindset. Adaptive talents and adaptive organization will be uh, will be coping with this very quickly. And I'm glad to see that Fraser is one of them. Thank Great. You. Cohen, drop the bomb. Tell us, <laughs> tell us, tell us the thing. We can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I'm just, just sort of hooking in on a, on a few things that, that, that you guys just mentioned. And, and um, it's it very interesting because I think we're all on the same page. Um, the e-world e is, is, is definitely the, the way forward. Um, for, for where possible, you know, in, in events, we see uh, conferences, the Mice World conferences, uh, uh, exhibitions even now, virtual, virtual exhibitions are a real thing at the moment. People want to go out there, find new products, find new suppliers. Um, so so, so th this is something that, that may be here to stay, you yeah? know, going into um, a, a big exhibition hall hiring that space, putting in power and lights and building all the stands and the big LED screens. Um, that is, you know, costly and not necessarily efficient. I think what this whole situation taught us, specifically that slice of the event industry, is that you can do that. You know, um, a friend of mine in Singapore just ran a huge HR uh, co conference, um, with global attendees, thousands and thousands of visitors. They all paid to go there. It's like attending an event. You can book the sessions. You can look, look at products within the expo areas, and I think that that is that that that's new. And that's not something we would have thought of probably a year ago. Because why would you do that? This is how we run corporate events and exhibitions. And you know now the, we can't fly, we can't meet, we, there's no gathering. So so the whole e events has become really become a thing. Um, and that's not going to work for all events, you know. Uh, people want to have a good time. People want to uh, 
dance in a park with a DJ, eat a hamburger, drink a beer, mingle with their friends. So, so that, that's the other side of the events that we work in. We work in the corporate events as well as, as in, in sort of music events and you know, festivals, DJs, live bands. That, that will be back. That will be back. Is that going to change very much? I think the, the SOPs are going to change. Um, uh, health monitoring is a must now. You know, where our wristbands, two or three years ago, they're a novelty. You could do an event without them. You know, you could, you could just let people in with a paper ticket. It didn't matter who bought, bought the ticket, where it came from, it's valid, you can come in. And we don't follow you through the event, what you buy, what you drink. Uh, now, now I don't think that's an option anymore. I think people need, need to be monitored to a certain extent. You know? If people um, do a health declaration that, that they've just been in a, in a high risk territory, uh, then, then you might not want them in your event. Uh, it could be something as simple as that, a, a two-question two survey prior to entry, like have you been in any of these countries? Sorry, we can't take that risk. We need to mitigate the risk. Um, there was a survey uh, I was reading yesterday that, 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 that came out in Europe about events and reopening events. Um, it's, uh, and it asked the questions about, are you likely to go back in events? Will you, will you go to, to uh, big size events again? 80% of, the, of the, uh, the, the respondents said they will go back to the events, but as long as measures are put in place. And I think, again, this is where uh, the good, the bad and the ugly are going to be separated. Good event organizers who've cared about people's health, who cared about providing a safe site, uh, technology to make things efficient and safe and transparent, these guys are going to last because you feel safe there, you will go there. You know? I'm in good hands because I know, you know there's temperature checks, there's health declarations, uh, there's sanitizing stations, uh, or, or whatever they, they're putting in place. The, the, the cowboys of the industry, yeah, they, they're not going to last, you know, the, the people are not going to trust that anymore. You know, the risks are too high. You're literally playing with death. So, so that there's a, yeah, a few things, um, what you, what you said, uh, John, you said it's not, it's not cool now. It's a need. It's a need to, 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 to know, you know, where people came from, where they go. There are privacy questions there. I get it. You know, our system can be used under a nickname as well. When you register a uh, your wristband, you know, you can, you can put in uh, a nickname in the app. So there, there are there are a lot of questions about privacy. And, and now going into shops in Thailand, you know, having to check in and out every shop you go. I see a lot of my friends online going, "Big Brother watching," and it's be here to stay, and it's not their business where I shop. But it is kind of the new normal, you know, the, the, the expression we, we use too, too much at the moment. But, you know, things, things have changed. And, and I think it's not, all, it's not all bad, you know. Safer events, more efficient events, more online events, you know. Why should we build, you know, huge exhibitions? And, and it all ends up in the bin afterwards, you know. Thousands of square meters of carpet. They use one exhibition. Afterwards, they go in the bin. It's all. It's the, the whole world. Is, I think it's been a wake-up call, um, and and I think we 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 rolled with that. You know, we we're going digital with our with our online events, um, the, the 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 click app, um, and and the, the the bracelet. Of course, we we will see um, also you know, reusability. These our bracelet, for example, to to pitch our product. You know, that could be used. So you could be a member of of a, a certain uh, ticketing agency or a certain event that you go to frequently and you just use that every time you go there. You don't throw it away after the event. You know, it's, it becomes um, an accessory, you know, it becomes your passport to, to, to enter uh, cinemas or events. At this, and that's what we see at the moment. And, and it will integrate and it will, you know, it will take in, consider in consideration people's privacy concerns and, and all that. But uh, yeah, people are more, more aware of health, more aware of efficiency, uh, social distancing, will work but only for certain events i saw in new zealand uh, live nation are, are putting events on now they're going to try to bring back events but with a ma maximum crowd capacity of 100 people obviously there's no money to be made there <laughs> uh, maybe for netflix maybe they could film the content and put it online because obviously online business is doing very well but it's going to be it's going to be a long while for 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 the the our traditional core business to come back and when it does, it's going to rely. It's going to be a very different experience. It won't be. It, it won't be what it was. Uh, the experience will be the same, but there will be a lot of different measures put in place to guarantee 
uh, uh, one's uh, safety and health. And, and certainly that cannot be a bad thing. Um, and then, yeah, you know, as we said, luck luckily we managed to pivot quite quick and we are now doing very well in the sort of the, the, the health products. Um, so, yeah, th things are going to be different, but things are coming back. You know, things are coming back. Um, Do we have a Coachella this year or next uh, year that will be as cool as the last Coachella or the last uh, F1 or FIFA events? Cohen, yeah. Yeah. what do you think? Well, they will be as cool. They will, people are desperate to. <laughs> there's this whole thing that, you know, people, oh, you can, you can do an event, but no one will go. No one will go. You know, people are too worried. Well, the, 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 the materials that I've been reading uh, recently, they, they actually contradict that. They, they will, people will go as long as they feel safe. You know? uh, so something like 80% of people are, are, are gagging to go back. Um, and again, it's if you, if you look at the boomers, they're like, no, I'll stay at home. I'll be uh, millennials and, and sort of a, a lot of the festival audience, they're, they, they're, they're up for it. You know? they're, they're desperate to have some fun. Um, Co Co Coachella's F1s and all these things. I think the vaccine is a big thing. I think the, the vaccine is the holy grail, right? Once we have a vaccine, everything will, will change again, but nobody knows when that's going to happen. And if that's going to happen, it may never happen. So we might be dealing with COVID waves every year. Uh, and again, I think that's where we, we, we've, we've placed our product really well because, you know, these, these wristbands are not disposable throwaway wristbands like we would have done a year ago. These are wristbands that you can use, you know, for, for a year or longer if you change the battery. So, um, so yeah, it, technology will, will help bringing events back. Um, apps, social distancing, tracing, and all these things that, that we're hearing at the moment. Uh, governments are imposing it. Uh, tourism Thailand is desperate to bring people back in Thailand. It's the number one tourist destination in the world. This country so heavily relies on tourism. They will put, they will have to put technology in place to allow people to come back in. And, and maybe all the tourists coming into Thailand need to wear one of our wristbands. Um, and that will be, uh, you know, a prerequisite for, for going on holiday in Thailand. If there's a choice between going into quarantine for 14 days or wearing one of these wristbands, you know, it's, to me, that's quite an obvious choice. You wear one of these wristbands and you're going to have a great holiday. You're going to go from, from Krabi to Koh Samui to, to Bangkok to, to wherever you want to go within Thailand. Yes, you're being monitored, but it means you can go on holiday. Um, uh, if, you, like, if you can't accept sense. that, you probably won't go on holiday. Sorry, Joe. Yeah, that, that makes incredible sense, especially for Thailand and, and uh, the management of the foreigners, right? I think we've been hearing a lot about this uh, tea something restriction, going to a province, you need to inform the government, etc. That would make total sense uh, for the government to be your customer here. Uh, maybe maybe uh, ONS or Kuntoy will help you guys to be connected uh, to this government institution, or maybe you're already connected. I think overall, what, what you said is really, is really great because we have this, this industry that has been heavily impacted uh, and coming from your perspective, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a great, great area of thinking, right? Maybe we have lost uh, our teenage years, parties and big festivals. Um, at least we've got the chance to do it. <laughs> we won't find a new Coachella next year. Maybe Wonderfoot in Thailand, which you know is one of the greatest even in South Asia, won't be as cool. So I'm glad I've been there last year. Uh, and uh, and no, yeah, it's time to it's time to to adapt, right? Uh, it's time to adapt. I'm I'm very concerned uh, about this privacy um, issue where where when I think of how Singapore and China are managing that, um, there is there is definitely not as um, privacy as for our country, right, uh, in, in, in Europe um, and, and maybe in the US. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see that and how this is going to happen and evolve. Um, I, I hear those big brother um, concerns. I think, I think, I think it's, it's very likely uh, to, to happen. And this is really where um, we're going to have to have actors and business actors like you to be the protectors of your event attendees and your customers privacy so i hope cohen uh, you will be play playing that role and uh, next time i attend one of your events you will not share the data to everyone 
on the internet. We won't, we won't. We, <laughs> no, we, we certainly won't. Um, it's also very interesting, actually. We, we as for what we do, uh, actually, personal data is not that interesting. Your, your phone number and your, your, your email address, actually, we don't really care about that much. You could be guest number one, guest number 721. For us, uh, the data is more interesting things like, what's the demographics for a certain event? Where did people come from? What time did they arrive? What time did they go home? This demographic, which is mainly Farang, they're all drinking uh, uh, vodka, but this local audience is drinking beer. Um, this kind of data helps you plan an event and be more efficient. It talks yeah. to sponsors. You know, if, if the audience is proven to be beer drinkers, you want to be talking to a beer company. If they're proven to be vodka drinkers, you want to be talking to one of the big vodka brands. So we, for us, the big data is far more powerful than personal data. Right. Uh, personal right. data nowadays, you know, we all got spams and filters and, and you know, for us, that's actually not that, that interesting. Um, communities are created on, on different platforms. Uh, interactions don't happen through, through mobile phones and emails anymore. You, you, you log into a community that you want to be part of. You follow that either through a stream or through their Facebook or their Instagram, or it, it could even be a, a, an influencer. You know, the word says it all. So I think the traditional value of personal data, I think that that's changed a lot. And I think big data has become far more important, uh, especially in the world of events than, than the, the individual uh, personal data. Yeah, and I think for this big data angle is really what Kunto here is all about, right? That's his bread uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So, so before we jump to, to Chula and Ons, I really want to, from your side, what's your view on this uh, privacy? Because that's one of the major concerns of everyone, to be honest, right? Uh, how will this data will be used? For the first time in the history of humanity, we have penetrated the body, right? Because we start to check temperature, we will ask you for blood tests, maybe before to successfully candidate for a job, right? And this is the type of modification that we have seen in Brave New World, all right? So, so, so for the corporate like yours, uh, Kuntoy, how do you see that? And, uh, and please, uh, make us feel better <laughs> because we are pretty scared, right? For us, normal consumer with no power to see all these big corporates, yes, achieving digital transformation faster thanks to the catalyst of COVID, but despite maybe losing most of our privacy, right? And giving that to, to the corporates and the government. So, so Quinto, where do you see this? And should I be scared or not? <laughs> uh, for Fraser, you, you shouldn't be scared of that because as you guys said, we don't really interested in personal data. Right. Maybe, more, more if, I, if I may, maybe not for Fraser, but in general, as you, the representative of the Fortune 500 companies, right? Because I know for Fraser, you guys, uh, you know, are quite ethic, but, you know, there's, there's many other companies that are as big as yours and that may see otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I think it depends on the context of what you're looking at. There's a pros and cons, right? It depends on uh, who going to use your data, right? But if everyone comply with PDPA, which will be, I think, launched, it has been postponed to next year, if I'm not wrong, in Thailand. I think users should feel more comfortable in sharing their own personal data with um, maybe companies or service providers. So there is an organization help protecting their personal data. And uh, I think the policy is quite well defined. That's what I heard. I just um, actually joined the conference yesterday about PDPA in Thailand. So for, for the use cases, for example, right, if you share some data with mobile operator, Basically, they, they, there is an uh, encryption process. Even um, the data scientists or data engineer, they won't be able to, to know your detailed information. Everything, everything is well protected and communicate through other devices as a media channel. So you shouldn't be worried about that. Yeah. 
And I think as a user, you must first check on terms and conditions before proceeding to the next step. Make sure that, okay, um, my data is well protected and the organization that you're interacting with, there's comply, they have uh, compliant with uh, PDPA policies and then you can proceed further. Right, so this, uh, this PDPA policy gonna be something that's gonna come back up into the public opinion and uh, in the mainstream discussion, I guess, next coming month. This is great. Yeah. So looking back, um, before we close the discussion, I really wanted to, to look back into the healthcare, right? Uh, and, and, um, and I think, I think um, True Hong Kong University have, have done some great work in partnership with the startup ecosystem to, um, to provide this test, right? So when, uh, when I got the chance to go to the hospital and have a test, um, this was uh, costing me 7,000 baht. Uh, which is approximately like, you know, $150 US. Uh, and, uh, and that take me, you know, three days to get a result, right? And thanks to the incredible efforts of the startup community alongside with the University Research Center, uh, Aunt Siri have been, uh, and her team have been able to develop a rapid test pod. Um, so, so Aunt, uh, if, you, if you're on here, uh, can, you, can, you, can you tell us a bit about this one and, and share us maybe overall outside of this innovation, also more innovation that you've seen in the market that were pretty exciting and COVID resilient uh, or remote economy resilient. Absolutely. So in order to help develop solutions for the current pandemic, the University Technology Center started a COVID task force to both identify new research uh, that can be applied to this area and to work with our existing startup portfolio to help them pivot and develop new solutions. Chula is working on two diagnostic technologies to detect the coronavirus. The first one uh, that John mentioned is a rapid test. Uh, it's similar to how a pregnancy test works, uh, but we use blood samples instead, and this detects the presence of antibodies within patients. Uh, it takes only 30 minutes to an hour uh, to perform. The biotech startup called by uh, Phytopharm is a university spin-off uh, from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences and is incubated by another organization within Chula called the CU Innovation Hub. The proteins used in the rapid test are grown inside plants that are native to Thailand. Uh, so this uh, rapid test is extremely scalable and sustainable as well. Uh, the startup has uh, launched its test kits and it's currently being used under research use uh, within Thailand uh, they donated 100,000 kits to the government, and we're seeing really good results in the southern provinces where the uh, disease outbreak is concentrated. Uh, UTC is currently helping them apply for regulatory approval with the Thai FDA under a special fast track channel so the kits can be developed commercially and uh, made available for the general public. As you may know, the regulatory process is uh, changing every day uh, with new laws coming out. And we're seeing worldwide that the regulations are changing to accommodate new technologies that are coming to market. Uh, in times like this, uh, where the speed of innovation is too fast for current regulation and policy to keep up, we employ a tactic called uh, regulatory hacking, uh, which is where we help startups understand uh, evolving regulations so that they can use this knowledge to form strategies for product development and for commercialization. Uh, the second technology that we're helping develop detects the presence of the virus genome itself. Uh, so this helps diagnose people that are just infected by the virus. This would make it uh, an extremely powerful diagnostic tool for point of care settings, such as for airports where we need to screen passengers and tourists in uh, near real time, or at pop-up screening clinics at lower resource settings. Uh, this technology is called the COVID scan and it's a diagnostic system based on CRISPR-Cas technology. It's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, origin story, really, that comes around full circle. The CRISPR-Cas mechanism was originally discovered in nature. It's how the bacterial immune system uh, detects and fights off attacks from viruses. Uh, it's currently being used for precise gene editing, and now it's being bioengineered as a diagnostics tool. And uh, this project is a collaboration between uh, the King Mongkut's Institute of Technology, Latgrabang, and CERTIS, uh, which is a big data and uh, artificial intelligence IT company. 
Um, by working with industry, uh, we have uh, been able to develop an AI-based application that reads test results uh, as they come up. And uh, once we get that digital detection, we can relay that information directly to central government so that patients under investigation uh, can be identified and any medical intervention or triage efforts can be designed around that. It's amazing. And Thank you for this, these details. We really see that you are working in the research center because you go really in depth and uh, thank you for that. I can, I can already smell that some of the projects you're working on uh, with Shula could be very, very relevant uh, in the application maybe for the product of Kuhn uh, with Perch Nation, right? Uh, can you imagine if we combine both products, we have a, a really good cocktail here uh, and on the AI side, um, I'm sure there's a lot of data that will need to be analyzed uh, and, and I'm sure Kuntoy uh, is, is on the interest on that. So, so yeah, uh, that's why I think this panel is really interesting. If we could put all of you together in one team, we'll oh, have, <laughs> we'll have Avengers uh, number five. Uh, I don't know what Avengers it is right now, <laughs> but uh, we'll have a new Marvel coming out, right? Um, so that, that's, that's really amazing. I think if you, are, if, you, if you have more perspective on the industry as well, so outside of Chula, what exciting things have you seen, you know, as innovation arms uh, during this COVID time? That is a great question. The silver lining we're seeing out of the current crisis is just how readily people, academia, uh, government and industry are coming together to collaborate and build solutions. We're seeing true grassroots efforts and multidisciplinary research and collaboration across industries on a scale and speed that we haven't uh, you know, really achieved before. It, it really goes to show that anybody can be an innovator. You can contribute remotely and make a huge impact. Um, every effort counts and is appreciated. You know, we, we wouldn't be here today without the generous donations of Thai citizens to fund our research, so we truly thank you. To go back to your question, uh, COVID-19 innovations can be divided into five main categories. Uh, the, the first one um, being digital or IoT, such as screening apps, uh, telemedicine and tracking devices, uh, such as the one Pouch Nation uh, is doing, um, diagnostic tests, uh, PPE or personal protective equipment, uh, sterilization appliances, uh, such as the UV robot developed by Fraser's property, and lastly, uh, treatment, such as vaccines or medication. I want to highlight PPE. Uh, in the earlier stages of the outbreak um, in March, uh, there was and uh, still is a huge shortage of medical supplies, such as N95 masks and protective face shields. We saw normal people uh, like you and me, grandmas and volunteers, uh, sewing face masks and donating them to hospitals. We saw makers in all parts of Thailand rally together and form uh, coalitions online to 3D print medical equipment and face shields for frontline medical staff. Um, one of Chula's leading medical device spin-offs, uh, Meticuli, uh, spearheaded the production of face shields for hospitals. Meticuli is a 3D printed uh, orthopedic prosthesis startup that used their 3D printing expertise uh, to go from prototype to mass production within just seven days. Uh, they started by prototyping a face shield design using 3D printing, uh, talked with doctors and medical staff to get their feedback, uh, studied FDA regulations for safety and performance, um, and also looked at sterilization methods uh, for so the plastic masks could be reused safely. But to you know to really truly scale, uh, they had to partner with industry and uh, ultimately uh, ended up using another manufacturing technique uh, that could churn out tens of thousands of masks. Um, in addition to PPE and diagnostics, uh, disease screening has been a huge area for innovation. We've seen a lot of chatbots and AI powered apps in this space. What was you know, once traditionally done on site by nurses is now being done through apps, um, further supporting the shift to contactless technologies. I'm, I'm excited to see more collaboration between startups, uh, doctors, universities, the government and industry continue to happen long after the pandemic has been contained. And uh, my wish is to have this uh, be part of the new normal. Okay. Okay, so I hope more collaboration will be seen. And uh, if there is innovation, don't worry, GetLinks will catch them and showcase them uh, during the remote job festival that's happening this month. And we 
just decided to extend it to next month because so many great companies, so many great innovation, and so many supports really going on uh, during, this, uh, during this COVID time between each other. Companies to companies, government working together with you guys, with the university, with the corporate. I think there is a new normal, as we said, in terms of social distancing, but there is a new normal as well, uh, or a new trend of helping each other, which uh, I think is great. We really start to feel like a community. Sometimes it's a little bit hypocrite, but uh, I, feel, I feel like it's good anyway. So just as a recap, right, um, we've heard today and understood that, okay, the social distancing is going to be a new normal. We're not going to have a Coachella that will be as funky as uh, last couple of years. Uh, but maybe uh, if we accept to have the wristband uh, of Poch Nation or others, we'll have uh, still access to some events. So social distancing will definitely be part of our new lifestyle. Uh, on the other side, the fear of, uh, of being in contact with the virus will be here every day and that will accelerate the, contact, the contactless everything. Right, in terms of how we pay, how we clean things, and how we probably uh, cohabit uh, in the street and in our areas, uh, in our communities. So contactless, everything is a big one. And as a result, we are seeing something big, which this festival is about. It's called the remote walking. Because as people are scared and trying to avoid social contact, they will come back to their initial Muban, right? Uh, their, 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 their second house or their family's house outside of the capital. And we will see that more and more. Um, during the panel we've got with the, the vice president of, um, of the Ministry of uh, Technology and Science uh, this week, we got to hear that actually 4.1 million people uh, who were in Bangkok uh, just disappeared, coming back to their, uh, to their area uh, in other districts of Thailand. Uh, if you realize, you know, 10 million people in Bangkok, that's like 25, 30% of the population that is gone, right? <laughs> uh, when will these people come back is a good question because they are part of the seven people, seven million people who unfortunately lost their job and income last six weeks, right? And this is where there's a reorganization on the macro level uh, on how the employment gonna work, right? In Vietnam, we're talking about 20 million people who lost their job in the last six weeks, right? Thailand, we're talking about 7 million, right? And these are the numbers from the government. Maybe there is, you know, new numbers that will come out from the international labor organization. But this is really the new normal. And this is what we call the remote economy. Uh, here with McKinsey. We've got the chance of having McKinsey to uh, probably do a session about this uh, next coming weeks as part of the remote festival. And this is really where we wanted as Get Links, um, the leading technology hiring platform in South Asia, to do something uh, to support this new remote economy, to create awareness about this, to create positivity, and most of all, to create hope for those millions of people who recently got unemployed. So during this campaign, uh, we already have got your company to join. Uh, thank you, Fraser, you gave a talk uh, with Kunsa yesterday, uh, and this is more to come. We, you gave a talk to inspire more companies to accept work from home, because today what we can see is we're entering this remote economy. More and more of the companies will accept work from home. Uh, Kun today is working from home, I'm working from home. And this is not only the new normal, this is a new cool, how enjoyable it is, right? Uh, how enjoyable it is and how what are the opportunity really to enable people globally to work on projects without having to take a plane or to relocate, right? So this is really what this festival is about. Can we connect ties that got unemployed recently to global work opportunities to make an income, right? So please spread the word. Um, as companies joining us here, you can contribute by simply sharing the hashtag work from home challenge and saved unemployed on your company Facebook page. Uh, we are okay with you as well, Chula, uh, to do that. Um, and, and yeah, thank you so much for joining this uh, amazing session. I hope this will uh, inspire 
uh, a lot of the talents that are looking at this video. And honestly, you are the hero uh, of, 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 this, of this crisis, right? The companies and the organization who have been building innovation, working days and nights to supply uh, the community with tests for Chula, to innovate in products that you know, could be used to remove this gun uh, and replace that with a, with a bracelet is really heroic, uh, as well as for a Fraser to be able to have this robot to clean up our surface. Uh, this, is, this is really the things that we expect from innovators. And thank you on the behalf of the GetLinks community to be representing these innovators today. Thank you and uh, keep, keep building great things. Thank you, John. Thank you for organizing this great initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thank that is on the backstage. <laughs>